Matthew, this is Javier, who's magnificent, and this is Daniel Zaruba. And Daniel Zaruba, you should know that Matthew literally just put out a piece connecting the Kyoto School to Heidegger, which was magnificent, uh, thinking through the question of anxiety, and also is doing so much work on the book Silent. Oh, I, I, I can jump in, that's all. <laughs> Beautiful soul. Um, okay. Um, because with Heidegger, I mean, with Heidegger, it's, it's, it's difficult to kind of, he always strives for the right way to speak. That's something I think we should keep in mind. He kind of, in being in time, he tries to invent certain words and kind of like to, to get out of the tradition of metaphysics. And then later this kind of more, let's say poetic language, I mean, comes from his, his, uh, his uh, auseinandersetz and his uh, deep conf not confrontation, um, just his engagement with, with people like Herderlin. And his, his uh, student Gadama said that Herderlin loosened up his tongue because uh, Heidegger was always striving to really, uh, to, to find the right language. That's kind of what he would call a kind of uh, a geschichtliches Deutsch. So a, a, a German that is, is being historical. I don't like that term because we've kind of, but we just say being historical. Um, and so that that is kind of like, that is is tuned to being itself. And that can say being itself. So he was always trying, kind of trying to, to strive for that kind of language that allowed him this freedom for this kind of new philosophy. My own critic, one criticism of Heidegger is, is uh, the first one is, is it's also with the issue of religion because for him, that's kind of like, that's closed. Like, like art for him, he says this in a German interview that's also on YouTube, he says, art is deeper than religion art can kind of like art can disclose the truth of being in a way that for example religion can't and for example nishitani the very end of religion nothingness kind of makes the counterpoint it's kind of like agape and this kind of self-emptying that brings us to the field of shunyata can disclose um tatata so suchness true suchness or, or true selfness um in this field. Um, in, in Heidegger, that would be something like, because Heidegger also has a kind of topological, has topological elements in his thought. He says very late, he talks about the Ortschaft, the science, and we have the house of being as well. Ortschaft means like, like the, the, the town or the, the village or something of, of being. Um, and for example, both Nishitani and, and Heidegger talk about like, because Nishitani, um, this is maybe, maybe you know this, that, that many thinkers from the Kyoto school were also accused of being right-wingers. Um, there's, there's this a book from, I forgot the title. It's on the Chuo Kuron. Uh, there were these, in the, in the war years, in the Second World War, there, were these conf there was a conference and they, they, um, yeah. they had those, they, they, they had some problematic views, all of them, and um, kind of in the 90s and the early 2000s, it was like a hot topic in, in Japanese philosophy studies. Um, uh, some books have been written on this. I think Rude Awakenings is the title of the book. No? Um, and so, so Heidegger, he talks a lot in, in, in public talks, he talks about, a lot about homeland and how we can kind of keep the sense of be, being at home in the age of technology. And there I find him so prophetic because he also kind of prophesizes the, the, the kind of AI, the kind of language computer. And that's, he kind of really foresees that this will throw us into confusion what even la what language is and what the relation of, of the human being towards language is. And I find him, I find him, I find him really invaluable when it comes to, to those, um, let's say ont ontological diagnosis, especially on language and technology. And also what, what is a thing, 
what 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 are things for us this has to do also with the wine and the lumber that i talked with daniel the other day um although i have no i have again a counter argument a lot of people from the new right such as dugin for example also heavily um like like take out a lot of from heidegger and I think sometimes that they're a little bit misled in there. They 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 mis misinterpret Heidegger to to some extent. Um, so yeah, that's that's then that's a different problem. But similar thing happens in Russia now with Dostoevsky. So so he had a revival in the last ten years, and he was really kind of like taken to kind of like the, the published books for like he's kind of like the embodiment of the Russian idea and he's really standing for true orthodoxy which is also then kind of tied to kind of Russian statism as you know the model of Russian orthodox church is is very deeply tied to to the Russian state um so yeah a lot of problems uh <laughs> yeah, I think I think my question coming out of what you said is like, um, what kind of resources do we find in Heidegger to think universality against the particularity? Because it's like that particularity is very prescient now when it seems like, like ba I mean, basically, I think that human beings are constituted by stubborn attachments. And I think that's a very Zizekian idea, like psychoanalysis, like fundamentally, we're the kind of these beings who irrationally resist optimization and uh and universality on just for for no other reason than desire you know but stubborn attachments but we but the way that the heideggerian gets tricked is that the 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 elite swaps the attachment for like the actual stubborn attachment for a constructed symbol that's more convenient and so they're distracted by the constructed symbol, mistaking it for the particular attachment. And then they find themselves throwing themselves into this project. Conveniently, it works out for the elites and those who are, whoever are kind of the symbolic uh, producers in the society. And so you need to have resources to think universality to be able to critique the particularity and not get trapped in, oh, I'm being fed this particular form of particularity that's actually not not actually what I'm looking for. So I'm wondering, I, I wonder if anybody wants to kind of address that. I, I can, I can take a stab. Take, take a stab. stab, stab it. And I'm not even looking for an answer. I just want to talk. Stab, stab something. I'm, stab not a, I'm not a Heidegger expert, but my immediate impression was death. Mm. You have to talk death, I think. Mm. Um, because... If you're talking about trying to prevent getting stuck in a particular, you have to think what that death is like, what that death would be as a possibility in order to rid yourself of that possible attachment to that particular. And I think what's ironic about that is that you have this trick that we play on ourselves where we think what we know as the, the possibility of death, but like secretly it's this yearning for attachment <laughs> to that particular. <laughs> it's kind of like when somebody says, um, uh, you know what? I'm happy that I'm single. Yeah, I'm happy. And so like, it seems like they're accepting the death of their uh, being together with somebody. But like it's not that it's that that's not what it is. They're just reaffirming that. <laughs> They're reaffirming that yearning to be uh, with somebody again. Um, and so it's I, like I when you imagine yourself dead, and all you can imagine is just consciousness, but with no vision. You just yeah. imagine being stuck in a box for all eternity. You know, like you're still fully conscious, but yes, you can't see or do anything. Like well, that's all you can imagine what death is like. You know. Mm. So I think. It, it goes back to a question of epistemology. And I think this is where the trick happens, right? They start considering death as a kind of epistemological challenge. I can know what the death is as this possibility, right? 
But the thing is, that death in itself has to be, in my opinion, a kind of surprise, a kind of like, you cannot anticipate what that death would be like. Um, like you said, right? I cannot consciously be like, oh, I, I know what my death would be like in a coffin. But, but you see, you're already using the tools of your aliveness to construct that death, right? So in that sense, you're not really confronting death, so to speak. And that, that is really what I mean. Um, and, I, and hopefully that kind of answers it, um, unless you're looking for something more particular and, and maybe a, Zaruba can help me too. But yeah, that's just my immediate impression when you said that. I totally didn't expect that answer. So thank you. That was really interesting. You literally took about a that. stab. Like you stabbed and you killed. It was death, stab. It was perfect. It all went together. Um, that, that, that's magnificent. Um, you know, a few thoughts come to mind. Um, once I was, I was actually doing a paper on like um, individual identity and it had a lot to do with say um, the identity of say, if you were black, if you were Latino or different things like that. And it's an interesting question because it's very easy to say what being Latino means you're not, like what's not Latino. But if you try to say what is Latino, you actually start offending people or upsetting things or limiting people, right? So there's always this problem on when you try to establish an identity, a particular identity, positively as opposed to negatively, right? Because then it feels limited. It's like, oh, you say, like if I were to say Latino is like a certain kind of food, it would be very offensive because, whoa, that's like very shallow to be saying that, right? So it's really difficult to say what it, what is, what it means to be Latino, but much easier to say what not being Latino is, right? So the paper went through and basically... The argument is that I don't think it's by chance that so many religions had death as central to their identity or afterlife or something like that, because death is a particular universal experience. You're the only one who ever dies your death, but everyone is going to die. And there's something also about death that's positive without being offensively positive, right? Like if I say, oh, to be a Christian means to die to yourself. Yeah. It does mean that. Uh, and it has a particular meaning of what that means for you to die to yourself while universal application. And I think one of the problems actually we're finding today is the difficulty of establishing positive identities for diversity without a concept like death. Uh, we, because the moment you pull it into something positive, it's like limiting and offensive, right? But then if you just say what it's not, then, it, then that's kind of the destructive, like uh, Burkean warning, where you're always saying what it's not, and it just kind of devours everything. Now, I'd have to elaborate on that. That gets into sublime and Burke and French Revolution, different things. But, um, but, but when you don't have death, because, you know, as Wittgenstein says that I always love, it's like death is not a thing in life, right? Like death is not a thing in life. And yet it's so weird because that would mean that we receive positive identity in our particularity based on a thing that's not in life. Uh, that would, of course, make me think the AB term I always like to use in Hegel and, and different things. Um, but I think what's so difficult, this excellent uh, question, and then I'll give it to whoever wants to speak. I think the question you asked, Matthew, is really, really good on what is the universal implications of Heidegger, because we can see how anyone can particularize Heidegger into their own agenda. But what are the universal? One of the things I would say, in addition to Javier's excellent answer of death, is that I think one of the reasons why it's hard in Heidegger is precisely because the universal is unveiled in the particular. Like all we deal with is particulars. So we universally deal with particulars. And the moment you shut the subject object divide, you're right there talking that universals exist in the plane where that divide is experienced as shut. Well, that's always particularized. That's always in the concrete to use kind of Hegel's language, right? Because it is in the concrete that the, that the, uh, that the idea is negated. Right. So like the idea, you have the abstraction, the negation, the concretion, that's his notion of science, but it also has wider implications. And what ends up happening is that it's only in the concrete that the ideas have abstracted. So it is only in the particular that the universal comes forth. But you see, this is why I think it's actually easy to misread. Let's put it this way. Any thinker who's trying to move beyond the subject-object divide is particularly prone to be particularized into a political project. Because if you don't go to the end of what they're saying, you stop like 98% of the way, well, then you're right there at the point when the particular unveils the universal, but it doesn't, so you stay in the particular. You see what I'm saying? Like you have to get to the end of the project for there to be the clearing of the particular in which the universal implication can come through. And if you don't go the whole way, that doesn't occur, right? And so like that, I think, is part of the trick that makes it difficult, um, and I'll pass it to whoever wants to speak, is that in Heidegger, the universal is a particular, is a particular, particular encounter. 
It's a particular suchness. It's a particular mode that each individual can have in their particularity of which could be universally applied, but the application has to be particularized. And that's where it gets really difficult because everyone could just particularize it to them uh, and then leave behind the suchness part, if you will. Uh, but those are some thoughts that came to mind first. That was, that was very good. Um, I mean, Heidegger, sol right? Heidegger solves this with the ontological difference. And then he kind of tries to figure out what's, what's, what's being? <laughs> what's the mystery of being? Um, and I talked about this actually yesterday because a friend of mine, he, he brought it up, um, this issue. And similarly, talked in different words but kind of like the issue was similar there's just a particular in heidegger um and then so but how does the particular relate to everything else and that was, that was kind of the mystery we were dwelling with and my intuitive answer was the problem is heidegger didn't develop a logic like hegel um that's kind of like he, he that that's kind of like and there are some, you know, this is, uh, I mean, this is a tricky issue. Like there are people like, um, what's his name? Graham Priest, who kind of like shows that, for example, in the, in, I think the, 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 the principle, I think the principle of reason is the text. I'm, I'm not sure. The later one. Um, <laughs> that, that, they, but because they all, they seem that there's a logic in Heidegger. There's a, then, but Heidegger didn't work it out so well. And then there's the logic of Hegel, and then there's the logic of the Buddhists, like Nagarjuna. And some people like priests kind of tr try to work out this kind of like what they call paraconsistent logic, dialetheism, these kind of schools that kind of like, this is a kind of post-metaphysical logic because they, they, they think that Aristotle was wrong. They kind of like say that the the the, the principle of non-contradiction cannot be cannot be held up, um, and I can really speak well from my experience. I can really say it for Nishitani. I cannot talk well about Hegel, but in Nishitani, right? You have this logic, and and Philip Nikas he made one one of in one of the videos I had. He made this comment that there seems to be a connection between in in letting go. So, so in order to let the logic unfold, we need to practice letting go. So when I say, oh, this is Daniel, and I clutch my identity with my attachment, you know, then I need to read, and this is kind of what you also practice in Buddhism, right? Then you, you, you learn to let go, and then you realize, oh, what I thought that this is Daniel, oh, it's actually not Daniel. <laughs> There's something more to this, this particular thing called Daniel. Um, and then, then, then with the practice of letting go, I kind of perpetuate the logic. I let it unfold. And, and in, with that, we kind of, um, we also learn to philosophize in, in some sense, but for kind of what, what for Nishitani, what we learn at some point is to learn to, to stand in this middle point, to see where or the so-called, this, this strange inflection point where let's say the opposites meet and also the universal and the particular meet. And then we can, you know, we can let them both be. Um, and when this comes not to, to nation, to, to like nations, I mean, there it kind of gets tricky, but some people like Nishida, for example, really tried, and Hegel, I think as well, they tried to find out the logic that kind of like accounts for this kind of like, you know, progression of also national identities into something like a world state or a world spirit. Um, because that was, I mean, that's what we have now <laughs> in, some, in some sense. So... Yeah, I think what wasn't accounted for is that it's not a human state. It's actually the regime of like an inhuman automaton that we're all sort of like in lockstep with. Uh, I almost feel like we can't, like everybody feels, I think everybody feels helpless. I think even all the way up to the top, even the people who are like 
who actually have their hand on levers that could impact things, I think everybody feels helpless. Like this machine is rolling on and there's nobody who could stop it or do anything about it. Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, I, I love Mark Fisher on, uh, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. And I think that he's so spot on there. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's it's so depressing. You have to kill yourself, Ankita. <laughs> <laughs> and then capital still has you. Point though. on the notion that in Hegel we don't have a logic, and I think that's interesting. And Heidegger, in and Heidegger, Heidegger I, I meant yeah. <laughs> There's definitely a logic in Hegel <laughs> that's trying to kill me. Actually, every time I pick up the science of logic, I may, I check my will just to make sure my my stuff's filled out in case I don't make it. Um, in Heidegger, the other thing I was going to say, actually, Matthew, I really agree with what you're saying about everyone in the system controlled. That's why I really prefer Kafka to Orwell and Huxley because in in Kafka everyone is part of this thing that's kind of dragging them along. Uh, the trial is quite good on this, obviously. There's also a movie called Brazil that's a really weird movie from the 80s by the guy who did 12 Monkeys that shows that basically the government takes over because of, of, of a paper jam that no one can control and everyone's kind of at the mercy of this thing. Which again, I always love that phrase in 13 Days about the Cuban Missile Crisis where he says, let us, uh, where, let us hope that the will of good men is able to stop this terrible thing that has been put in motion. And I find that so interesting because the leaders are talking about like there's this thing pulling them toward the apocalypse and yet they're the most powerful people in the world and yet they can't stop it. And arguably that's a Nash equilibrium game theory dynamic. Arguably that's logic itself, funny enough. Like logic itself and rationality pulls you in a game theory direction of a Nash equilibrium where everyone has a suboptimal result. All the more reason to figure out how to update Aristotle to something that's more, you know, I'm going to say Hegelian because I'm biased because basically the only way to escape a Nash equilibrium is a non-rational variable. Someone has to do something of which is not rational for themselves, but who's that going to be? Well, that, the reason why that's important Game th for me, game theory should have been a revelation that autonomous rationality is not adequate. Instead, college departments have used it to create models to increase rationality. I think it's the complete wrong direction that game theory should have taken people. It should have been a revelation that you need another way of knowing than rationality. Instead, we're just going to create models to avoid it as we run into another financial crisis. Uh, but anyway, uh, for me, the, the point you made, Mr. Zaruba, on Heidegger not having a logic is quite, quite interesting. That's a very good point. Um, now, of course, I'm biased and want to believe that Hegel and Heidegger can go together. So I think, it, you know, and I know Mr. Thomas Wynn will be doing a lecture on Heidegger's Hegel. And we need to call up Daniel friggin Luber and bring him in on this bad boy because Luber is great on the Kyoto School and Heidegger. Dang it. I think he's at work, though, the jerk. He needs to get fired. He might get fired. He's in California. Everyone in California might lose their job. Except, Ma except you, Matthew. And remember, if you do, we have an extra room on the country farm. So you're good, man. We got you. We, we got your family, your kids, everyone. We, have, we, have, we, have, uh, we also have calves and barn cats. So there will be lots of entertainment for the children. But it's also, I wonder this, Mr. Zaruba, is it something where Heidegger, it's almost like he wants to keep it in the phenomenological because he's seen how logic leads to standing reserve. Like, like when you reduce things to like logical constructs, he's seen how that is kind of at the heart of the Western metaphysics that has led to the technological thinking that has reduced things to standing reserve. Now, of course, as we know, Heidegger is not anti-technology. He's anti-technology doing our thinking for us. He's anti the outsourcing of thinking. And is there something about logic that I wonder, like for Heidegger, it's almost like logic too easily becomes computation. And therefore, you want to keep it on the phenomenological realm because the phenomenal, because really the challenge of overcoming the subject object divide is in the phenomenological, right? Because you experience things as divided, right? Logic, it's almost easy to believe that it's separate from you because it's like two plus two equals four, A is A, that feels kind of. That feels kind of um, non-contingent, objective, as if there is no subject or object divide. But the problem with logic, it has a reductionist tendency, right? Like you just reduce things to logic. Whereas for Heidegger, the whole name of the game is figuring out a mode in the phenomenological to overcome the subject of object divide for the clearing. So maybe that's a reason why there's less incentive to do logic. Uh, and that, I guess, would also go in the direction of um, his emphasis on, say, poetry and, and so on later on. Um, but then, of course, I'm now 
extremely interested. I've never read Heidegger's book on Hegel. I think it's mostly on the phenomenology, not the logic, uh, because it would be very curious if there's any writings of Heidegger on the science of logic. Um, I, I suppose we'll see that and when. I don't know of any, but I don't know German, so he could have some obscure note somewhere that has the revelation from the island of Patmos. I'm not sure. So those what are I've, thoughts. What I've heard is that, that you know, Heidegger wasn't so good with Hegel. He kind of like, oh, Hegel, but... <laughs> um, <laughs> Bad thing, but aren't uh, we all? Yeah, at the end of the day. The <laughs> truth of the matter is, every time I take the science, I actually have gone through 20 copies of the science of logic because I every day burn my copy, <laughs> you know, and then I'm like, no, I have to go back. It's very dialectical, actually. I liked what you said, Daniel, about like lighting thought into computation because what's interesting is that technology doing computation is not engaging in the encounter between subject and object so it's not doing the same thing and so but like the way that the like enlightenment rationality says is like oh that means it's getting closer to the truth that means that it's like unencumbered by our issues but it's like no 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 our issue is actually the, it, like the obstacle is the way yeah. uh, to quote a popular stoic um but <laughs> uh, but like I, but like actually that's what's interesting is like the the there's so much about how like human beings being having stubborn attachments and being conscious creatures is seen as the as the problem when like you can st and this is kind of my like beef with buddhism is like i agree it's the, it's the problem but i don't think that it's something that we should be trying to solve like it's like accelerate push through it you know like it's um a, a, you know that's that's kind of at the heart of some of my of my philosophy is i see the mind as a wound but i think that what is interesting about christianity is that it's trying to inhabit the wound it's trying to like push through the wound and find life through the wound rather than buddhism sees the mind as a wound which requires a therapeutic remedy uh, and so like i guess that's kind of where i draw this divide and um, but it's it's interesting to me, back to the point, is that technology is not doing the same thing. Technology is not thinking. But how you view that, like the value judgment you bring to that statement says a lot about you. I'm going to add quickly. Now I want to do a conversation series on responses to the wounds. Because one of the problems you kind of have almost with any of these interrelation, like interreligious dialogues is they don't have a central subject by which differences can come out. And then what ends up happening is people have like, like cheap arguments against different, like, for example, Heidegger talks about Christianity as an ontotheology, you know, ontotheology is a waste of time. Well, Aquinas wrote way more hymns than he did anything else, right? I mean, yes, there is the risk of talking about God as being turning God into an empty concept, but I would be quick to say that you necessarily see that in medieval theologians. Now, you can argue that you don't agree with their theology. That's fine. That's no problem. But kind of the idea of like onto theology is not a term I recall any um, any person um, any person going by. Just like Gerida, you know, I we talked about this at the net the other day. Like Gerida's not like, oh, by the way, guys, I'm a postmodern. Just so you know, I'm a deconstruct. Like these are kind of titles afterwards, and so that's like that was brought up earlier. Like that's that is a weak point of Heidegger, in my opinion, is the onto theology stuff, which then closes them off to religion. But that's where the Kyoto School and different things get quite interesting, right? Um, and it's almost like you need in order to have like a mature dialogue between um, theologies and religions. And I agree, Matthew, that Aquinas was a mystic, and it's so freaking important to see that for Aquinas, the onto theology is utterly secondary to the mystical, right? Like the mystical becomes so primary to it. And, uh, and then of course that leads us to the million dollar question of what is the relationship between theology and faith? Do you need theology for faith? Does faith lead to theology? And then you have faith seeking, oh yeah, pseudo Dionysus. Like dude, um, and Anthony is so good on him um, at Intrinsic Research Co. I love that guy. Um, but, uh, but there's a relationship which I think Austin Farrow is really good on. And I have a really long paper on Austin Farrow that has never seen the light of day because most papers I've written have never seen the light of day because you have to go <laughs> back and freaking edit them, I hear. Um, I think also now I'm thinking, so the idea of circling wound is quite interesting as well. Um, the other thing I would say, now I'm wondering if there's, a, I like the term you used, unencumbered where we think that logic and math is unencumbered. It's almost like if you take the unencumbered route, you end up enclosed, right? Like you end up enclosed and kind of shut off. 
uh, and then you get into a self-relating negativity that leads to effacement, right? So it's kind of an irony there where you would think that unencumberedness would lead to openness, but it does the exact opposite. As you try to seek something that unencumbers you in like raw logic or mathematics, you get enclosed almost like a total depravity sort of thing where you're locked into a world that is only mathematics and thus you've reduced everything to something that's not even alive, right? Because that's, because the problem with reductionism is that it works. That's the problem. It works. If you reduce the world to simple variables, it makes sense. And that's the problem. It makes sense. And therefore, you come to conclude that this must be the right way to think about the world because it works when it only works if you shut out everything else from your experience of which would um, unveil to you that it doesn't work. Ergo, relationship, people, phenomenon, colors, lights, and everything that works like that makes life worth living, right? Math is great if you're a flatlander. Uh, it's really unfortunate if you're married because you cannot use math to figure out what you should do on Valentine's Day. I don't know, unless you know something I don't. I, you know, you let me know. But it's funny how as you make the reductionist mistake, and then I'll pass it to whoever wants to speak. As you make the reductionist mistake, you think that you're becoming unencumbered in the very act that encloses you into a world that is only that. And of course, that isn't the world. And so you leave the world behind. I wanted to return a little bit to what we said before, still with the logic mm. and Hegel and Heidegger. The problem might be that that I think Heidegger thought that for Hegel, that nothing was a concept. And then there's the danger that it's an empty concept. Nishitani takes over this critique, of course, and says kind of like that as soon as the logic is just perpetuated by reason, it cannot really, like, it cannot experience then true no thingness. So it must be a logic, what he would say, of existence. And there he is kind of really in the existentialist camp. It must be something, right? It must be so, that that's, and then there's this whole attraction to people like Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, for example. Nietzsche was so important for Nishitan because, right, they lived out. <laughs> This. it's a it's a it's a truly living logic as it is with mystics like Eckhart or Buddhist mystics you know and that's perhaps that's and, and I think you know with negativity like Heidegger wrote a lot of ne negativity in Hegel and that there's always I think the danger that finitude or death are just reduced to concepts and then, then we fail to grasp what they what what's what it's really about in there. And I think the problem of finitude is also the problem by why Heidegger might not have developed the logic, because you know how to in, how to incorporate finitude, or or really this that, that's really that's mm. really um, that's really I think that the, the key, because as you say right, death is a particular universal experience in in death and finitude. It's always, it's all has always been, right? It's us in Christianity, right? The moment you die, you come face to face to the absolute. And you're also, you're also in a sense, this, this particular thing called you, that's finished then. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of like finalized and, and given over to, to, to uh, the other world. So in death, in death, infinity, I think like the question of the, the particular the universal kind of like gathered together. And, and so, so, so it's like, it's like the, the kernel problem. Um, mm. Yeah. I, I just wanted to, um, you, you said something on Buddhism, which I, which I found interesting um, um, because I always thought Buddhism had this interesting position because people constantly, actually people say this, right? Like um, the constant understanding of Buddhism is like, okay, to desire nothing but is but doesn't that also a desire and so like people always you know kind of like critique buddhism for that right but actually the the letting go of attachments for buddhism is a kind of logic that subverts its own logic so for example the very fact that you get for example if you get if you get fixated on letting go of things you ironically uh contradict yourself because you get attached to the concept of letting go of things <laughs> right so it means it's like the letting of letting right mm -hmm. it's the letting of letting so you you let go of not only attachment but you let go of that attachment to which you are trying to let go of attachments 
Um, and so there's that paradoxical thing that I feel like a lot of people kind of miss with Buddhism. But mm -hmm. so, so Buddhism kind of accommodates for that paradox. It's very subtle, actually. Um, it's, it's very hard to catch um, for, for most people. Um, but that, that, that's been like my own grappling with Buddhism. But you said something earlier. Can I just yes. jump in, Javier? That that's an important point. I mean, by the aporia, the paradox, the irony that comes off in it, the paradox, is is so is so key, right? In 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 this whole thing, and also for the practice of the practitioner. Um, so so right, struggling, learning to dwell with the paradox, like. Axel, right? He, he he said once, it's like learning learning to hold the the, the hot potato, <laughs> so it's something like that. Um, and then that's kind of that's kind of um, that's kind of what what the practitioner has to learn. And it's similar. It's similar in in, in again with people like Kierkegaard or so, when, or Soc Socrates for that matter. Just comment. yeah, yeah. So so I think if there is going to be a logic. Um, like Zeruba is talking about, I think it has to be a logic of irony. So this is probably where I'm going to be most yeah, key yeah. to guardian. It has to be a logic of irony. There's, I don't see another way. <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't be kind of against logic. The only way I would be, I would only be for logic if it's against logic itself, right? It has to be that kind of logic, that kind of just pure irony. It's like, yes, I want logic because I hate it. I want it, <laughs> so I'm going to have it, <laughs> and then I'm going to go against it. But I need it. Um, and, and, and actually, Matthew, you said something interesting earlier about, um, the inhuman state or something like that, um, which reminds me why I think this fear over AI actually has a lot to do with how we identify as what it means to be human, mm -hmm. but actually the very identification of what it means to be human is in fact inhuman. That is why AI can take over what is human is because it is in fact inhuman. And this is the fear that is kind of ironic because AI is not really taking over what is human. It's what we thought for such a long time is human, but that in itself is inhuman. And that is the only way that the AI can stay within that realm. And so it, it goes, it, it bends back on itself again with this question of what is man? So it's not, it's not the fact that technology can become human, it goes back on itself again, whereas we have to ask the question, what is man? Mm -hmm. And we go back to the Heidegger question, what is being? Um, and so, but what's another irony in this is that we get something called what Viktor Frankl calls um, hyper-intentionality. Hyper-intentionality is this excessive focus where you essentially block the very thing that you're trying to access. So for example, if I want to sleep, and I can't sleep, and I keep obsessing over the fact that I can't sleep, uh, then I can never sleep, right? And Viktor Frankl's kind of solution to this is just stay up, right? Make it ironic, just stay up. Um, and, then, and then you fall asleep, right? So just try to stay up instead. Um, and I think we coming across the same ironical problem with the, the issue of AI. Um, and then there's a deep irony in that. And I think what we call as math, human variables, those are all in human constructs in themselves. Um, and I think this is why an onto epistemology, um, because onto epistemology is the only way that you can incorporate epistemology in an ironical way in order to live, <laughs> in order to express your being and, and, and be in the world. And, and like Kierkegaard says, like um, what matters, the truth that you have is that you pick a truth and that you live it, right? Um, and that's totally, and I feel like the irony with that, with, with people trying to, are so afraid of AI taking over is that they never really lived. They, they've relied on a kind of epistemology for so long about the way the world works, the way the world functions. Um, but in fact, they've never really lived and it gets embodied in the AI as a symbol of that kind of anxiety and fear. And that's why it's more important than ever that we read people like Heidegger and, and Martin Buber and Kierkegaard. I mean, the logic of irony is absolutely pressing uh, to talk about uh, anything like this, you know. So this is why I am 
like so deep into psychoanalysis because I think that psychoanalysis provides the direction for this. Like at the same time, it's saying to be like the inhuman, the the stupid is at the center of what it is to be human. And yet it also and, and then it says, but this is also what we circle around. It's that wound. And so like um for instance, uh Catherine Malibu is kind of talking about this um almost like like this this blunt force meaningless trauma is kind of like at the heart of what we are as subjects um you know that's what she's talking about with the plastic and Zizek is getting at this idea of the drive just circles around this wound and the wound doesn't have a meaning like it just it was pure historical contingency and but it is inhuman like the wound is it's inhuman in this sense of it's purely contingent it's material it's stupid you look at it and it says nothing and yet the formation of the subject is precisely comes out of that wound and circles around it perpetually and so this like the the inhuman is at at the heart of what we are but then the humid becomes this like response that comes out of the inhuman and that's what the the machine can't do because the machine can function the the machine smoothly functions and yet we can't smoothly function we're like lacan talks about like a camera that's jammed and we're stuck on an image and so but it's that stuck on an image ironically that is the constitution of our freedom and so we need to like and that's why the machine can't do our living for us because it can't get stuck on an image. I want to go back and tell Aristotle that the rational animal should have been the stupid animal. He got that wrong. Uh, and uh, I was like, sorry, man, you're, you were pretty good on a lot. But it, uh, um, it's also, uh, it is interesting that to Javier's point that if we define ourselves as the rational animal and AI is more rational than us, then we're screwed. But if we understand that the rational animal is somewhat reductionist and that that's inhuman, then the AI can only take away something from us that's inhuman. And so if the Holy Spirit spirit wells in your heart that's not going to end up on the hard drive so you know the hard drive cannot take the holy spirit so jesus uh so anyway also i would like to confirm that if you tell your child to just go to sleep they're up till two in the morning but if you say fine fine stay up they're asleep instantaneously uh so that does work mr frankel is correct on that um i i also think that uh you know heidegger had this one letter or something somewhere that derrida loved where he drove, where he took the word being and he did a slash through it every time when he's talking about being. Like basically logic has to have a slash through it. And a way to view Hegel's logic is logic with a slash through it. And that's why it's always this negation of the negation of the, uh, you know, that logic only works if it gets to the place where the logic kills itself almost, right? Because logic has to, logic has to reach the place where it stops trying to get rid of the wound or the hole or the lat, right? Like logic has to bring you to the place where you get to the wound and then leave it alone. So logic has to entail its own slash through it, right? Now, and I think you find that in Hegel. And for me and Michelle, like we'll use the word um, whole. And whole is funny because you can put a W in front of it and have whole, and then you can have whole H-O-L-E. So we like to say the key for the human is to somehow become a whole with the W in parentheses. Like that's the name of the game where the whole is always there, but you're able to have a certain W wholeness in relation to that whole in the W's in parentheses, not the whole in parentheses, because in this life of finitude, that whole seems to have a certain constitution. And this is the part when one goes, you know, maybe, and then I'll give it to whoever wants to speak, maybe all those religions weren't so crazy after all. Talking about original sin and fallenness and Pandora's box. Here's the key. This is what we fail to understand. If I come up to somebody 2000 years ago and say, hey, following psychoanalysis, you have a fundamental lack in your ontological structure. Yeah, okay. Uh, you know, you may not, it may shock you to know that that doesn't tend to make much sense to people until after 2000 years of knowledge, building on knowledge, building on knowledge to get to the place where you can even understand psychoanalysis. There's this wonderful book by Verve, V-E-R-V-E, -E, where he asked this question, um, where he asked, you know, imagine, imagine going 2000 years ago and talking about like global warming, for example, or, or computers. You just start talking about computers. They literally would not, there would be no possibility of them understanding what you're saying because the concept of computer requires 
centuries of building upon one another so you can understand it, right? And unless you go through all that, you can't even talk about computers or any meaningful sense to someone, right? So if you're 2,000 years ago or, thou or whatever, and you're trying to talk about a fundamental wound in ontology, you cannot use those, those terms I just used. You're going to have to use a language that everyone can get. And what is the language everyone can get so naturally? Because children, just as soon as they are born, want them. They're called stories. Stories is a kind of universal language. If anything is the universal grammar that our dear Komsky is talking about, it's going to be something akin to story. Story is so fundamental. I think this is where Heidegger is also like story comes before language, music comes before noise. Like there's something kind of fundamental to all of this because, and the thing is too, the other part I always make, like, let's say, let's say it was like, you say, okay, you're talking evolution or something, right? Like you go, like if, if you were trying to talk about evolution 2000 years ago, nobody would have any idea what you're talking about. Also, if the, if Genesis literally started with evolution, then humanity would not have free will because God would have to exist because look, the theory of evolution is right here in the book of Genesis. Therefore, it must be a product of God, right? Also, the Bible wouldn't exist today because no one would have passed it down because no one would have understood it. What the crap is this book talking about? They wouldn't have passed it. And so you have to have a mythological structure to deal with the problem of finite knowledge that cannot develop except through time. And yet it has to make sense now so that it can develop through time. If you don't have the mythos of Genesis, you don't have something Lacan can talk about later and you never even make it to Lacan. And so mythos has a justified structure in historical development because otherwise you never get to the place where you can translate it into a psychoanalytical language. And also it just wouldn't even arrive because people wouldn't have passed down that mythos to you today because they wouldn't have freaking understood it. Um, and also people wouldn't have been wrestling with what does this original sin fallenness mean? What does it mean? What does it mean? Psycho, cycle, 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 cycle. So thousand years and then you get to Lacan, right? Like for Lacan to do his work, there has to be all of those years of people trying to figure out what this mean, what this mean, what's this mean, and then you can bring it out in terms of a fundamental womb that we're orbiting. So you can see that maybe just, may and then I'll give it to you, Matthew, maybe just maybe all of these religions had something going for them. I don't know. Just going to throw that out there. The Holy Spirit can't be on a hard drive, everyone. Just keep that in mind. Uh, Matthew, what were you saying? Yeah, the, the, yeah you're, you're right that you couldn't walk up to somebody in the first century and say you're ontological structure is built on a fundamental lack but what you can tell them is the son of god died for you right and like and that that is that's saying the same thing and yes. and what's like that's how that idea could first be represented in the human consciousness and then it begins to work and it starts to generate more and more and people are like oh wait if that and then then this and so like that's that's why I read Christianity in this psychoanalytic lens, and it's why I wish I could talk to Nietzsche, because I, God, I love him so much, and I wish I could hang out with him. But like this is where I think that he he needs to take lack more seriously. He needs to not see it as just like something that the slave is bound up in. He needs to see how lack is the engine that produces abundance like he wants abundance but he doesn't have an engine for it it's just this pure upswelling of will and innocent becoming an affirmation but like you can't have any of that without an engine to make it run and it's lack that it that that creates the drive that creates the movement there's actually no movement in a perfectly whole and complete system so i think that he's like like the yeah, that, that's like, that's one of my biggest struggles with Nietzsche is I, you, we need the lack and he denigrates the lack as, as something that leads to, to like a lower life. But at the same time, the reality is that the lack is required for there to be even abundance. Uh, a comment on that. Um, first off, I think Nietzsche, right before he lost his mind, was all actually planning to read Kierkegaard. And that would have been fascinating actually. Uh, you know, when he read Dostoevsky, it was like, oh my gosh, this guy's a genius. And he just was not, um, there's a lot of these kind of more Christian existentialists that I think would have caught his attention. Um, I am always very interested. I think um, there is actually a kind of metaphysics in the background of Nietzsche that's basically Schopenhauer's capital W will. 
Okay, I think that's kind of lurking in the background of Nietzsche, even though he hasn't, he couldn't care less for the pessimism, right? But the, here's the question. What is the relation of capital W will with capital W wound, if you will? Does the will emerge out of the wound? Is the wound, is the will wounded? Like, is the most fundamental thing a wounded will, almost? Or is it a wound of which then the will is trying to avoid or to cover up? I'm very interested between the relationship between those two W's because I have that long paper on, you know, I talk about bestocentricism in Nietzsche and like the, the metaphysics of the will. I think that's an interesting question because, and this is another reason, there's a few things I was going to say. One, another reason why I end up from like Hume to Hegel and end up in Hegel with all of this logic stuff is because I think there is this problem of some of their thinking ending up in, um, you know, you mentioned Duganism, Russia, the taking over of Dostoevsky. I think there's a, a major problem here that has to be worked out. Now, I could elaborate on that, but I will save you the I will save you the trouble. Um, I think this kind of relation between will and wound is a way that I end up thinking about like being enters into the, the nothing that then becomes, you know, there's a becoming that occurs here. And so for Hegel, the thrust of the movement of notion is becoming of which is some kind of dialectical relationship with some, between something you almost can associate with will and wound in a way. Um, now, what's also tricky, I also wanted to denote earlier, you were talking about how in Buddhism, there's this problem of being attached to non-attachment, right? Like you can have this kind of like, you got to make sure you don't do that. Well, the issue why I think what's key for, it seems in Hegel, because Nishishani, he seems to th think that um, nothing is a concept for Hegel, or it's like a thing. When really the tricky move that I, that I find very interesting is Hegel is the seemingly isomorphic relationship between nature and notion. And where when idea tries to think of nothing, that it cannot think because nothing is there, it then has to enter into a becoming. Oh, but guess what? If you have an autonomous becoming independent of a dialectical relationship with being, that doesn't work either. Very similar. Like it seems like he Hegel is all about becoming, but we always have to keep in mind that in the same way that you can have a problematic um, attachment to, to non-attachment, you can have an idea in Hegel where he's saying that all you should ever do is become. And that's not actually what he's doing, but arguably in Nietzsche, there is more of a kind of becoming, like a self-realization will. So you need to take Nietzsche and situate him within Hegel. Um, and I actually think you need to do that with David Hume as well. Um, and then what ends up happening is the relation between nature and, and notion. Nature is always upsetting notion. And notion is always upsetting nature because notion is trying to translate nature into terms of notion. Another way to put this, the, the phenomenon of the cat is always greater than the idea of the cat. But because you can think of the cat, you can pick up the cat and throw it in the barn. You can change nature by the idea. And yet the idea is always upset by nature, right? There's a way to look at this as in what you are willing to do is being wounded by the fullness of what that thing is because it won't fully be captured by it. And yet at the same time, nature is kind of being changed or wounded by what you will to do with it. And so there's this really kind of funny interplay that's going on between these things. But here's the key. This is where Heidegger would step up and be like, see, look, it's actually um, the movement of thought is A, B, a bothness and incompleteness with the I in parentheses, just like phenomenon, because the thought can never be the phenomenon. It's always missing that. As it approaches it, it's like the hole with the H-O-L-E, right? It can't get there because it's always greater than it. And yet the phenomenon itself cannot develop in its fullness without ideas. The grapes cannot become wine without ideas. And so phenomenon need ideas to realize their fullness. And yet those ideas can never fully capture the phenomenon. And then Hegel's like, and that relationship between, idea, between nature and notion is the subject, baby. The subject itself is a constant interplay of this thing trying to be a thing it cannot. A fundamental Godolian, Godolian, <laughs> that's a good one, uh, you know, incompleteness uh, that is always trying to capture itself, but precisely because it cannot capture itself, that there's two options. It's either propelled forward in a creative act or it effaces itself. Like once you kind of get that the structure of being has this wound to it, that wound is either the, the wound of Christ that leads to resurrection, or it's the wound of a black hole where you get sucked into hopelessness, right? You're just kind of sucked. And so that seems to be the challenge. And then the last thing I'll say, and then pass it to whoever wants to speak, 
all of this about the like you were saying matthew on you can tell of the son of god and that means the same thing and how there's that kind of language that now could be psychoanalysis the first thing is that speaks to why interpreting new ideas into past contexts is justified like it's not just kind of projection because you have the problem of a concept having to build on itself to get to the place where it can understand itself in a new terms. And then you can understand the past in those terms to unlock it in ways that otherwise would not. That's why it is not necessarily a hermeneutical mistake to do that because of the way knowledge develops. Um, and this is also why I'm very, very close to falling down a Rudolf Steiner um, black hole, because he seems to have some sort of notion of consciousness developing through history. But I have taxes to pay and other things I'm supposed to finish. But Rudolf Steiner, I'm this close to falling down a, a black hole, because apparently his whole thing is about this. Don't know. But Owen Barfield, I'm convinced, is a hyper genius, and he seems to really like him. So, oh, gosh, I don't know. But anyway, those are thoughts. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <I'll go. laughs> Barn cats. Yeah. Um. <laughs> so uh, there is something uh, interesting here because I've done I've done some work on on lack um, and desire, and I made a new distinction for myself: passion and and desire. Mm. Um, passion. This is where I'm. I, this is where I instantly realized I must have been like a reincarnated Kierkegaard because I was like, oh my god, Kierkegaard, you're saying all the right things. <laughs> passion, passion, passion. Wait, you're a Hindu um, Christian. <laughs> what? Okay, that's fine. That's fine. It's A B. That's fine. Incomplete. Um, so, yeah. Um, I have this example on lack, where um, I try to inverse the notion of lack because I feel like the way people understand lack is is very A A. Yes. Um, and I try to inverse the notion of lack by saying, for example, if you have this um, pitcher of water, right? And you fill it all the way to the top, but then you 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 continue to keep filling it. So water keeps spilling over, right? But if you were this um, uh, pitcher, wouldn't you feel like water is uh, leaking from you? Wouldn't you feel like water is all of a sudden lacking from you, from like just your own perception that you see like water just sort of dripping out of you, when in fact you are already full? But it's just the fact that it just keeps this overspill, keeps overfilling. And so it looks like a lack, but it's not. It, it actually, the lack is on the sort of outside, right? Um, and so what I like to say is like, you're not lacking, it's the world that's lacking. Um, and so what, what, in my opinion, what this does is this initiates the drive to strive to engender something, fulfill something. The problem with the AA lack is that the person looks at their lack like the world is already fulfilled and they can, they can fulfill what I need. And so that's the kind of lack that's, that psychoanalysis has basically proven is a Zeno's paradox. You don't move anywhere with that. It doesn't go anywhere. Um, but if you invert it, and you say that the world is lacking, that, that causes, in my opinion, an inner movement to want to engender something, want to create something, imagine something. And so this is where I go from, um, we need to take the, what I call the excess of desire and, and turn it into passion. So desire, I, I identify desire as something that wants to possess something right? It has an object or it imagines an object to possess, right? Um, and then I say passion is somebody that is possessed. Doesn't want to possess, but is possessed. Um, and he's so possessed that he has to engender something. It is an excess in itself. He wants to imagine, create, um, love. It, it has a lack. It, the world is lacking. He, he has a drive to fulfill it with something. It's not that he's lacking because he's possessed. And so this is what I call passion versus desire. Um, and so what's ironic about this is that you have to acknowledge the wound. Mm -hmm. And this is where will and wound start interacting with each other, right? And so this is, this is what's really funny about the Jesus story. Um, that I, I think it's always like puzzled Christians for a while. It's like, so Jesus knows he's going to be crucified, right? Why does he say at the end, Father... Why have you forsaken me? <laughs> Why does he say that at the end? 
<laughs> but what's so ironic about that is like in order to fulfill something, you have to acknowledge what was lacking. And so Jesus looks up. And he says, why have you forsaken me? So this is like the acknowledgement of the wound to which then he strives to fulfill by accepting that crucifixion and, you know, you know, purification through sin and everything. So it's like the world itself is lacking. It's lacking that pure uh, purification. And so in order to fulfill that, you have to once acknowledge the wound and then you fulfill it with that abundance of what you already have. Mm. Um, and, and, and I feel like this is like the sort of like irony. And I, and I always try to say like, um, the problem with lack is the way we interpret where it's located, in my opinion. It's not that lack doesn't exist or that lack isn't real. It's about the lo location of that lack. Because I feel like the way people interpret lack, it's very uni unilateral. It's like only one way. Like I'm lacking, um, he's not lacking, and that's why I want it. That's why I want what he's got, right? But but the, the quicker you realize that the other is also castrated, you start to understand that there's a kind of abundance in acknowledging that. And that that's the irony, mm. in my opinion. Yeah, that's where it's lacking. I, I love that you bring this up, Javier, because frankly, lack is, I, that's like at the center of like what I focus on. But so I have to quibble with you a little bit because I, I don't endorse the phrase that you're not lacking that the world is. Like that... I because the reality is it's you both lack because you it's your lack is a course is corresponds to the perception of the world's lack so like the re, the reason in your scenario that the water that that the the bowl perceives themselves to lack is because they are experiencing a standard, an abstract standard to which they've come into contact with. And the thing is that both that abstract notion is lacking and by their, by coming into relationship with that abstract notion, they also discover that they're lacking. So I think that lack, it's corresponding, constitu it's constitutive of the subject. It's about the perception, the formal perception of lack within the subject and the, actually that lack that pushes us outward towards the world. So like, um, I, I've got a paper that I'm hoping to publish soon on, on push theories of desire versus pull theories of desire. And I think most people think in terms of pull theories and you're kind of describing a push theory, but I think that, I, I think we need to, we need to be honest that like the lack in the human is real, but that uh, in the sense of like, the perception of it makes it real and here's the mechanism that makes the perception of it does that kind of make sense yeah yeah i guess if i were to clarify it's more like what i'm trying to say is like there's this difference between ontological lack and epistemological lack and that's what like i'm trying to get at is like the way we understand lack is epistemological and so like there is something the only so god this is such a deep irony uh, so, like, the irony of me saying, like, the world lacks is, like, him fulfilling that very lack which himself lacks. Um, so, it's, like, it's an ontological lack, not an epistemological lack. So, I think this is the difference, right? Um, people get stuck in the epistemology of they think they know what they lack. That's the problem. And so actually what I'm trying to say is that you cannot possibly know what you lack. And that's the lack. That's the ontological lack that you have to live. And that is the demand that needs to be fulfilled. And so that's why I say that the world is lacking because it initiates the ontological drive to do so, um, which is the ironical thing. But that's why I cannot say that the person knows what they lack in the midst of their lacking, but it gets fulfilled in that fulfilling of what the world lacks. And so this is like, and hopefully... Uh, you captured this because I know I'm going through like a woo, 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 kind of thing, woo, woo, kind of motion here. But yeah, it's it's really the problem that I have is the epistemological notion of us knowing or thinking what we actually lack, and I think that's the problem with you know like it, it, Frankel talks about this a little bit with suffering. He says. Um, we tend to make our suffering meaningless because we look at, you know, like the survival of the Nazi camp or something, right? Like you might say like, okay, look, I'm free, but like 
nobody understands what I went through. So like, isn't this suffering kind of meaningless? Um, and, and Viktor Frankl says something like, you have to understand that that suffering that you went through was meaningful. It's just, you have to understand that that very meaning is not something, it's not a notion that you can grasp. Um, it was, it was life questions you, you don't question life, life questions you and you have to answer. Um, and, and that's what I really enjoyed with, with Viktor Frankl is that that's why you get stuck on this epistemological notion of black when somebody says, well, what's the meaning of life? See, that's you trying to question life and you, you're, you're, you're trying to epistemologically situate lack. And that is, that's what I disagree with. I feel like you cannot epistemologically situate lack. Of course, I feel like, now this is the irony, you have to epistemologically talk about it. <laughs> but this is where I'm most, most kick a guardian is that you have to live it. And this is where like Lacan is so interesting because he's in, when we look at the development of a child and this lack, what happens is originally the experience of the human being is being totally dependent uh, for their needs. And, but those are concrete needs. They are needs of food and being held, being moved around, of having your butt wiped, like all these sort of things are very concrete, but somehow at some point, this other demand gets mixed in of right of love itself, of like this ineffable quality of not just, I don't just want my diaper changed, but I, I want, a, I want a love. I want, I, yeah. there's somehow this other thing gets mixed in and it comes in this, Lacan's trying to get at this gap between the need and the expression of the need in language and how basically the child has all these needs. The only way to get, and they're totally dependent, they experience their bodies, this complete chaos. So they experience themselves as lacking, and then what happens is they need to get into this game of language, which comes from the outside. It's totally alien. They have to pick up these alien tools in a desperate attempt to send smoke signals to the these human beings to get to get what they they need. And it's in the gap between I start speaking and my message reaches the send reaches the recipient. It's in that gap where we begin to experience the demand for love. It's the what do you want from me? that Lacan is talking about. And so I think that this, that is where like th there's all of these like screwed up sort of processes in that happen as the child develops that creates the situation. It's the child's initial need for initial like set of concrete needs that through the mechanism of language and their total radical dependence ends up turning into this thing where there's now this thing that's almost abstract and impossible that is now included in the list of needs, which is just love. And, but it can never fully be given. And so now there's this need that can't be satisfied. Um, yeah. I, I would also give a take on this whole, it's very interesting to listen to you. And, and the, the, the more we get in, I think the more we come close to, to the heart of the issue. Mm. Um, I often, and we, we heard necessity just in the last five minutes, a need on necessities. I think mm -hmm. it's really important if we talk about lacks. Um, for me, I, I also really like Nishitani's kind of topological model because right, the first is kind of the field of consciousness, kind of like normal ego state where we judge the world, you know, or I need this, I need a new car because I'm lacking it. It's kind of, <laughs> it's, it's like, it's like very, very superficial, let's say superficial needs kind of viewed from the ego perspective and its drive and so on. So, and then, then at some point we, we might, you know, we, we might uh, wake into our own finitude and the fact that we are mortal and then suddenly it hits us like, oh, I, I'm really, I like, like, what am I? <laughs> what's, what's, and, and then we, we really question, right? Questioning the nothing or nothingness is also like questioning the lack that's at the heart of one's being. And then we may realize, you know, that the last step is this, you know, the, behind the, the lack. And this is also right. This is this way, way it says at the very beginning of religion and nothingness, right? You have to become a question to yourself, and then only religion, right? To the question of religion, this deep question about, let's say, soter soteriology about salvation can be asked. 
Um, and then you may realize that behind the lack, maybe there's a revelation of fullness of a kind of ineffable dimension. Um, and all of this, right, like love, so, so agape, like this self-emptying love that is also perpetual, so that also is like shown by the example of Christ in the letter to the Philippians. That's also, I mean, that's a key issue that kenosis, kenotic self-emptying um, is like a key thing for this realization of this ineffable dimension. Mm. Um, I was a little bit before, very long, like, I don't know, 30 minutes or 40 minutes, I don't know. Um, you were talking us about the wound and historical contingency and that kind of like this inhuman thing, this kind of like brute contingency is, however, creating the human being. And I mean, in the Christian tradition, I mean, they found a cool way to talk about it, right? It's a parasite. And the parasite is this strange thing that we, we don't know what it is. It's like, because it doesn't have a substance in itself. And that's really true for, for viruses. They need a host. They cannot subsist in themselves. So now I forget, like I will use the Christian language. Um, so they cannot subsist in themselves, but we can. So, so right, because Aristotle was so interested, like why, why, right? There's there seems to be right. There's a form, right? Like I don't, right? We don't grow like chaotically as human beings, but there's a kind of trajectory. There seems to be a logic, a biologos, like biological logic to how we evolve. And any historical contingency, so evil, is just, uh, is, is just like a, a virus, is just a, a parasite on creation. Mm -hmm. So St. Maximus also talks about that the human responsibility, right? We sit on this strange threshold between the, the earthly and the angelic. So St. Maximus says that we are the priesthood of creation because only we can kind of realize those wounds and those lacks and kind of help, you know, we can, we can nourish the baby, the, the kind of like the sick tree, the sick people, we can help carry them forward and, and bring them into their final subsistence. Let's say we can bring them closer towards their ontological good what they were supposed, so to say, by, by God's creation. And, yeah, there was something else, I think, like on knowing and, you know, why, why Kierkegaard, you know, Kierkegaard stresses faith. And I think that's important why, why he kind of liked the words from Hegel, because Hegel stresses absolute knowing and the Kyoto school, like, but the existentialists didn't like that. And then Athens and Jerusalem. That's what, but I don't want to go into that right now. <laughs> no, that's, that's wonderful. First off, um, uh, to what Javier, you know, what Javier, it's very interesting because I think this gets back to why you have the difficulty of language in Heidegger. Because when you're trying to describe something, you're looking, you're coming at it in different angles, cup, what's the best language? And we have the advantage of a word processor where we can uh, delete. He only has paper and pen and has to redo everything, right? It's, it's very, very tricky. Um, and so one can understand also why things are written the way they are. And today it's very easy to be judgmental on the difficulty of text. But I just imagine how, like friggin' Hegel writing the science of logic with paper and pen. I can't even fathom this. Uh, it's extraordinary. Also, I really like what Matthew, you were saying about this thing where, you know, when I have my diaper changed, I start going, uh, yet like yesterday, I start going, oh man, I love having my diaper changed. So I need this mother to change my diaper. I love having my diaper changed. Oh, I love, I want love. But then love can't be given back to you in the same way as the diaper change. But that gets kind of mixed in there. And now there's a lack, right? I really like how you describe that, Matthew, because it's like, it's almost like you say, diaper change, diaper change. I like my diaper change. I like my diaper change. I love my diaper change. I love my diaper change. I love, I love, I want love. Like it's like gradual through time, it becomes love. But love, of course, is a thing that cannot be direct, given the same way as a diaper, right? And so there's an interesting way. I like how you described that. I thought that was very nice. Um, the, the other thing is that Javier, on kind of the idea of what's interesting, 
first off, I associate um, the push theory and pull theory, as you know, I'm obsessed with it, intrinsic motivation versus extrinsic motivation. And there's something about when you become your own push, you are intrinsically motivated. And there's a strange way in which it's like, I am my own need. Like I need myself and I am my own need. I am my own drive, which is very strange because that means there's a kind of split in you that then you need. And now it's the split one. Now it's the wound. Now it's the thing that you can never encapsulate that you're always trying to get. So there's something weird that happens that when you become your own drive or your own intrinsic motivation, there's a split in a weird way. And yet it's a kind of virtual split. And yet that virtual split seems to be concrete. Like that's what's really weird is once you get to this lack place, the um, the abstract, the concrete and the virtual, they all compress together, which would suggest that being itself is not ontologically what we think it is. We tend to think that being itself is materiality, atoms and all that. But all of this would suggest that the raw composition of being is actually some sort of strange mixture of the virtual, the actual the concrete, all of these different terminologies. But we've been so trained to think of deepest ontology as a singularity, not a multiplicity, let alone a multiplicity as a singularity, like the Trinity. If you were to believe that everything is made in the image and likeness of God, then one would expect, if you believe that God is a Trinity for the very structure of all of being to have this multiplicity in a dance of a singularity. So you start to see how in the act of intrinsic motivation of one's wheel as a wheel, you start engaging with yourself in this very profound way that seems to be the split one. And yet it's precisely in the acceptance of that split that then one can integrate with that and avoids um, what I like to call effacement, self-destruction, all these different things in favor of negation, sublation. Um, now, the other thing, uh, what I understand, you know, to, to your point, Javier, it's almost like what happens is you have a lack in yourself and you just say, oh, the world has what I need. So you go look for it. But the key step of maturity is when you go, oh, wait, the world is lacking as well. Wait a minute. That means there's nothing wrong with me. Like the moment you realize the world is lacking, there's a negation of the negation, right? Because you go, I'm lacking. The world's lacking. Oh, wait, there's nothing wrong with me to be lacking because there's, that's everything, right? So there's a negation of the negation. So then you stop. But this is the funny thing. In the very act of realizing that everything is lacking, now you're presented with a choice, like an absolute, I like to call it the absolute choice. Okay, so is it the case that all of being is lacking in some sort of fundamental, is correct? There's nothing wrong with you to be lacking, but what is the meaning of that lack? You know, for Zizek, it means that eh, there's some sort of negativity that's fundamental to being that he's studying quantum mechanics to figure out, right? Like that's why he's gone into quantum mechanics and so on. Or could it be that the world has fallen relative to a God, right? Like that there's some God that we fall in our relation with and the reason you have that. And that's why I think when you get to this point that you realize that it's not that lack means there's something wrong with you, but that lack is actually fundamental that then the question is, why is it fundamental? Is it because lack is part of being itself in some quantum sense or because there's some um, alterological choice, as I like to call it, alternative being that is not fully being seen? Like, because this is the last move I'll make. I always find it very um, interesting, the words clearing, opening, wound, and all of these terms. They're not exactly similes, but they're also kind of the same, right? A wound is an opening in the skin right? A clearing in the forest is an opening in the forest, right? So there's a way in which the wound is the opening, right? So in Heidegger, there's this idea if we can clear everything aside, almost like if we were to wound the forest, if we were to wound things, then that would actually turn out to be an opening from which being can come forth, right? So the question is, is this fundamental lack that we're describing that seems to, to define all of being basically of all shapes and forms and colors and whatever, we have to choose if it's an opening or if it's just a gaping hole. <laughs> like there's a choice here. Like is it, is the wound an opening? You know, it's clear that there's a fundamental incompleteness that's a kind of wound, right? Is it an opening 
for something to come forth or an opening to fit into something. Like the Christian story would be there's an opening because it's supposed to fit uh, into the, mar ma you know, the marriage of heaven and earth, Jesus, church, et cetera, so forth. There's an opening that's a receivership because what is an opening? When you open a door, what does it mean? You're receiving. Someone can come in, right? So like the idea is that you need a wound to let someone in, right? And this is where also, if we want to get really crazy, you start seeing why exactly in myths, like so many religious myths, there's um, sex, birth, and death are all kind of uniform right like there's something about the wounding language in sex right like sex wounds it spears you hear that all the time there's death in birth all of these things kind of come together and it would seem as if there's something about these language of clearing opening wound that is also overlaid with this interconnected thing between sex death and birth that seem to all be come together that all is suggesting some sort of opening fundamental opening and be itself that we have to choose if it's an opening or not because the reason we have to chew it choose it is because we have to choose our attunement and relationship to it are we going to try to heal the wound well, that's a problem because that leads to all the pathologies. That's ignoring Lacan, right? You're denying the wound if you heal the wound. Or are you going to become hopeless because you're like, oh, great, reality is fundamentally wounded. That sucks. And then you just kind of drink. <laughs> or are you going to go, no, no, no. Reality is fundamentally wounded because the wound is the prerequisite for the opening to receive higher life, beauty, truth, and goodness. Because death, is an opening of which makes possible the consecration of which is necessary for the beginning of life. So death, open for concrecation, or the term that means sex that I can't say. Uh, what's the other term for dialogue that means sex? Intercourse. So death is opening wound for the intercourse that makes possible life. So death, you clear, you make a death in reality, clearing Heidegger open. The open can then receive intercourse of which then can burn. And then you have a new life. And it seems as if I'm moving my hand as if that means the, I'm making a new sign language because I did sign language for two years. So I'm trying. Uh, so there's some sort of movement here where those three come together. And then maybe that would suggest why so many of the religions are talking about these different things in different ways. I have one more image, right? I thought of Plato's cave. And mm. there must also be an opening where the yeah. light of the sun can shine through. Yeah, I'm also having flashes of the end of Evangelion where it blurred together all of those things. So now I have the end of Evangelion. Also, <laughs> I meant to say that when you said I want to take a quibble with you, Javier, I really wanted to start playing that Attack on Titan music and I just didn't have it on that. Yeah, that would have been really good. But uh, yes, Plato's Cave is the opening. So it's sex in Plato. We all knew it. I think, I think like what you're getting at is there's something more complex that's going on in Christianity where like it's not the decision between are things essentially incomplete or are they incomplete because of the fall but Christianity is actually saying like these two things are true and we're constantly having to pick apart each moment like because oh, sure. there is the there's the present like we, there's fundamentally the incompleteness of being you know because it is not self it's not self-subsistent it is it's lacking and i mean even at like you know quantum mechanics this level like it, it it's incomplete and so there's this like you know you still need to eat and uh eat and shit and all these sort of things like we have these needs so but those aren't those aren't a product of the fall like those aren't evil I, but they're all, like they're the source of suffering they're the source of angst but then there's this other thing this this other category evil that we're trying to figure out how to talk about to where we don't equate it with these other things but we can also like identify what it is where it's operating and make ourselves and oppose ourselves to it and 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 not let it become what controls us or what feeds us and so i think that like that's also why i see psychoanalysis as this a part of that christian tradition because it's trying to articulate Yes, there is like the fundamental suffering of existence, but then there's this this alien thing that's operating in us to where it's like, why is it possible that human beings do things that are bad for themselves? Yes. Like, why are we the only creatures that do that? Like, why do we enjoy our own uh, destruction? Where does that come from? There's this other alien thing in our in us operating, and both Christianity and psychoanalysis are trying to name what that is. Because it's beyond just the general frailty of a creaturely existence. 
No, and I should clarify quickly. First off, actually, whenever the barn cat comes on the porch, it is doing something that's self-destructive because it's not allowed on the porch. No, I'm dead. But you're right. Like, you don't see cats engaging in irony uh, that I know of unless they have a secret language. Um, second, by choice, I don't mean a one and done. Uh, it will be an active choosing and also, like, choosing to do the wrestling. Like, the language mm -hmm. of choice makes it sound like, hopefully in the paper, it's clear. But I never know because there's a lot of hyphens and parentheses. Um, the, the choice is an active engagement to do the wrestling, really. A, a active engagement. Because you could just say, no, I ain't going to do that wrestling. I ain't going to do that working out. Uh, or you can choose to show up every day, really. Um, also, there's a weird thing in Christianity, depending on your doctrine of grace, where you really can't choose for God to act on you, but you can choose to be open to God active in life. So it's like a negative choice. Like you can choose to believe, you can choose to believe that you're nothing without Christ, which is strange. And yet it's a kind of choice. So that, but it's actually ultimately the agency is in God, right? So it's like, you can choose to believe that the agency is in God, which, which then means there's an open, open, openness to that agency that is simultaneously not primary. So you also have to would go into the details Oh, uh, there you go. Uh, the details of the nature of that choice, right? Because even in Heidegger, like you can choose to make the, you can choose to believe in the clearing or make the clearing, but that doesn't mean being shines forth like automatically, right? Like you have to like make the clearing or clear yourself or position or attune yourself. But then when does the being come, right? Like when does the being come point? That's where it can get a little more mysterious. Uh, but it seems like there, it's like it's conditional, but not guaranteed, or you can't like if there's conditions that have to be met, but when the thing occurs is not in your control, but what is in your control is meeting the conditions to be there where the thing can occur, right? And so there's this complexity of the nature of the choice that is being described here that has to be followed. Also, everything you were saying too is why I think it's so important, and then I'll give it to who wants to speak. Like a lot of what we're talking about is not primarily a, a seeking, but an ordering. Like I always love Augustine where evil is a disordered good. You know, there's nothing wrong with food, but something wrong with gluttony because you have a disordered relationship, right? So much, is, so much of evil seems to be a disorder of something that is, right? And so it's not rightly conditioned. And so likewise, in order to have the clearing in which being can come forth, in order to have the wound be an opening for birth, there's a certain conditioning and a certain ordering that has to occur. And that's where I would get into Hegel because I think a lot of Hegel is basically that, uh, this certain kind of emphasis on ordering as opposed to getting. I just want to say that this coming forth, right? We could also talk about as gift, being mm. as gift. I don't know if you've anyone, if you have read Ferdinand Ulrich. He's kind of like a thing, because D.C. Schindler, who, who like uh, has kind of written on him and translated his book, which was just released like one year ago or two years ago. Oh, that's the Balthasar um, guy, Schindler. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He's great. Yeah, Ferdinand Ulrich is very unknown, but he, he kind of tried oh. to synthesize Aquinas, Heidegger and Hegel. And nice. if some of you, this is very difficult. If some Order. of you wants to read this, like... <laughs> Like I, I just read something and then you can I, uh, I don't know, you can tell me what you think about this. Here is for Aquinas and for Ulrich, created being is non-subsistent being, while God is subsistent being itself. Um, professor so and so explained how being's non-subsistence makes possible its infinite actuality and its gift. In her interpret interpretation of Ulrich. Being's nothingness, i.e. that it's not a thing which subsists in itself, gives it its gift character. Since being has no self, it does not have to keep being for itself. Rather, its nature is to be given, to allow another to be. Further, because being is gift, it is also a task. This can be understood through the dynamic fulfillment of Ulrich's metaphysics and meta-anthropology. In Ulrich's thought, human being is both the apex of created being and a shepherd. This means that being is not only for man, but man is for being. I don't know. It's, it's and, really like, it's, it's, it tries to synthesize all of this into a Christian meta framework. But this is like, I, I need some people to kind of like get. Tell me there were hyphens myself. between all the words. There were hyphens between all the words. Please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like, what's, what's great about this is that this is actually exactly what, like, what you just read is what Lacan says. I quoted it in the chat. Love is giving what you don't have to someone who doesn't want it. 
because what like yeah. no, like what's being yeah. given in creaturely being is literally a lack. So it, it's one, it's a lack is being given to you, which you did not choose because you didn't choose to be born. You didn't choose to undergo this this suffering journey called life. You were thrust from the nothingness into existence, into suffering and pain and shitting your pants as a baby uh, a, that you did not ask for. And so what's interesting is that this lack that we we're given, this gift, is both the fa- is, is not something we asked for, and yet it is literally a nothingness. And you're right. I, I love that point about it is the foundation of the infinite variability. Uh <laughs> Oh man, so this is where I like Boober, which grounds me <laughs> in my thinking. Um, but I will I will quote Kierkegaard, where he says, even the capacity to receive is a gift. Um, <clears throat> which is the ironical relationship between lack and excess. Um, and so to to to, to reel in Boober, this is why I don't spend like too much time talking about like desire and uh, like I, I like psychoanalysis, but I don't like dwell too much into it. <laughs> uh, is because Buber always says we have like the danger is, and this is his critique of Heidegger, is that he extrapolated existence from man. So Heidegger decided to talk about existence by itself. Um, and for Buber, it's not about that. It's always between man and man. It's always being and counter being. Um, and so this is why his fundamental logic is about dialogue. And as much as we talked about the will and the wound, I think Buber would interpret this as the problem of the other. The wound in itself is other. Um, but what's interesting about what Buber says is that you can't know the other, but you can embrace it. You can feel addressed by the other. And so the whole point of, of, of this is to allow the other to be other in itself. And, you know, and, and, and so th- this is what like, um, th- this is what's difficult about like, this is why Buber has such a problem with like um, psychoanalytic terms and, and psychology is that you tend to, uh, you, you risk the chance of reducing the other in the very fact of you talking about those mechanisms. Um, so like the very fact that we like, like this is why I'm like always very careful, like I'll engage in the conversation about like desire and lack and so on. But like I fundamentally have to be very careful to not reduce the other as other, right? And, th- and this is what's like really like difficult. And this is why I always feel like the problem of other is like the most apparent problem. Because like when, you know, Matthew, when you said like, oh, I got to quibble with you for a second. Like, to me, like, that was, like, the real engagement of the other. You know, like, the co- like everything that was being said, it was like, okay, okay. But then, then the other showed itself and was like, yeah, I'm here. And that's what Boober wants with dialogue. Um, <laughs> and, but the problem is, it's like, it's such, a, it's, a, it's such a problematic stance because I think ultimately we fall into Derrida's issue where we reduce everything to the logic of the same. Like thinking has this capacity to assimilate everything into the logic of the same. And so it's very important that we don't, uh, and I'm not saying that you were, but it's very important that we don't like assimilate uh, the other into the a kind of sameness. Um, and so one of my favorite, um, Thomas Merton breaks down one of Buber's interpretation of the fall, which I really love. And one of this story is that he says, Ad- the problem with Adam and Eve is that they wanted to know they were good. And so they engaged with the tree, but they didn't know that they were already good. Like they were already good in, in, its, in, in and of itself. And like, so this is like the, um, this is kind of like the debate that we're having with the lack. It's like, you want, but you want to know, <laughs> like you want to know this thing. Um, and that's what already, it, that's already what involves you in that situation. Um, and, and so like, that's why I, I really like Buber's um, kind of like reversal on this, where it's like, you can't know, but you can feel addressed by it. You can embrace it. You can uh, engage with it as other, because other than that, you risk projecting your thinking, your logic onto the other as such, and so you end up speaking for the other as such. And I think it's very important that if we talk about the wound as other, we try not to speak for the wound, 
itself. And I think that's like the danger, at least that's the danger for me. We try not to speak for the wound, but let the wound speak for itself. And I feel like that is my opinion, confronting the wound, making a choice, having a stance uh, and, and so on. I feel like that, that's my position. Uh, one thing on the wound in psychoanalysis, just, just one little comment. I mean, you know that Freud, you know, the, the thing that the, 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 the wound, so to say, is of course, you know, the circumcision for him. But he never talks about it. But this is like castration fear. And it's kind of like for as little for well, like babies. I mean, I've heard this is very traumatic often, like a circumcision. But at the same time, you're initiated into this greater truth, into this greater community of pers of, of greater persons. Um so yeah, in every wound, there's an opening. <laughs> that might be the that might be a good title for the for the conversation. <laughs> um. No, that's magnificent, and I fear I will have to run. But a few things first. Um, it's very interesting because as you've been talking, um, so if we associate the wound with a kind of death. And death is not a thing in life. And there's also been this talk about this kind of idea of embracing a thing not there, like a lack. Like you're in a bit, you're giving something that cannot be received and you're receiving something that cannot um, be given. You know, there's this interesting kind of interplay. Well, that isn't how most people see these things, but we're assuming that you've come to the place of the development of the subject to see it as such, right? Okay. Which is, again, a certain, you could say, phenomenological journey to use Cadell's language and, and Hegel's phenomenology of spirit. So there's a certain coming to a place where you see things in this kind of, I want to say negativity, but it, that's not quite it because it's, it's a positive negativity. It's an incompleteness with the I and in parentheses. You under it. We've used the language of wound, lack, and so on. And it should be noted that wounds can make you stronger, life, so on and so forth. What's very interesting is, you know, so life tends to be birth, sex, death, right? But there's also an idea in all, so many religions of new life, right? Like there's a new life that you can have if you carry yourself in the world in the same way. And what's interesting, it's almost like for this new life, rather than birth, sex, death, it's death, sex, birth, where you have a reverse order. That happens where within your determinacy, to use Hegel's language, or in your life, you say, I'm going to choose to actually accept some sort of lack, some sort of wound, some sort of death, some sort of thing not in life, because this is what's weird. Everything we're describing is a thing not in life, right? The thing that you're giving cannot be received because it can't be in life in the same way that a pen can be. It's, I guess the term is virtual, but I'm always hesitant with that one because Berg Bergson means it one way, Deleuze means it another. I'm never sure what virtual means, but a lot of them are going to be like, it's virtual. You can't, the gift you're giving the other is virtual. It's there, but not in the same way. It's a, I think virtual means actual possibility, but it stays an actual possibility. So in a way it's nothing, right? It's very strange. Anyway, so what we're saying is some sort of virtual interaction, all of which means interactions in terms of a thing that is not in life in the same way that everything else is in life, right? And we've talked about, and that would include wound, lack, virtual, etc. And we've talked about death as a thing not in life. So it's as, it's as if, if you can start living this way, then you've started the path of the new life where you have death, then that creates an opening for the consummation of the being or Christ or other life, because you have an opening and now you have the birth of the new life, right? So we have this kind of wound becomes opening, becomes receiving of being or God, or coming forth of being, because if we're talking God, the metaphor of up, down won't quite work, right? But it's interesting to think that life tends to be birth, sex, death, and then new life is almost death, sex, birth. Um, and that this death we're talking about is all of these kind of forms of virtual living, these acceptance of the I thou, the acceptance of a kind of lack that you never try to fulfill, but you integrate with um, and actually see as an opening to let something come forth or to receive something. And then you get the new birth. You get the new life. It's also to note that sex is like center of both of those. So maybe that's why so much of society is about sex, if you think about it, right? Marriage, birth, religions have so much about sex. Like it would make sense that like sex becomes central because in both of those structures, it's the middle pillar, but the question is the order of death and birth, 
right? Uh, where we tend to be born, go through sex to death, as opposed to death through sex to birth, right? The last thing I'll say is I think everything we're describing as well, um, and then if anyone has closing thoughts, please. Um, the, the other thing I think that we're seeing is that the metaphor, quote unquote, of the Trinity is a much more advanced um, intellectual technology than has been proposed for a long time. People have thought of the Trinity as some kind of weird contradiction thing. But it, what, what it would seem to be that actually, literally, the Trinity does describe how being is. A multiplicity that has a singularity, actuality in relation to a virtuality, a irreducibility, and yet a shared intelligibility. These are the kind of the kind of categories of thinking that can, can emerge in taking the Trinity seriously seem to be the categories of thinking that is needed for taking reality seriously. Now, of course, that may be my own bias. You know, I already mentioned not letting the AI get the Holy Spirit. So we've got, you know, that's good. But um, it is interesting increasingly to see how the Trinity is a much more useful um, intellectual technology, if you grant me that phrase, than has been uh, proposed uh, in the past. But anyway, the thing I just have been thinking about is life tends to be birth, sex, death. New life seems to be death, sex, birth. Um, and that this language of the wound and the opening and the clearing and the being and all these things might, might point to something of that nature. Um, and now that we've also established a relationship between all of the things, um, I've enjoyed this immensely. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for your thoughts. I appreciate it, Matthew. I'm always a pleasure to speak with you. Javier, always a pleasure. Mr. Zaruba, always a delight, sir. And um, thank you uh, very, very much. I've enjoyed it, gentlemen. Yes, there, uh, there may be no sexual relation, but I'm glad that there's a relationship here. Oh, my gosh. That's